Shalom, shalom, Yasharal. Welcome again to another edition of Watchmen of the Faith Ministries. My name is Kasada Ba. Now before we do anything, let's begin with prayer. Yahuwah, Bahashem, Yahusha. Yahuwah, Bahashem, Yahusha. Yahuwah, Bahashem, Yahusha. Rabbah Tada, Rabbah Tada, Rabbah Tada. Father, we give praises and honor to your set-apart name, Yahuwah, and to your son, Yahusha, who died and made restitutions for the nation of Israel. Father, I pray that you continue to pour out your Ruach HaKodesh upon all those that desire to do your will, and your will is following the laws, statutes, commandments, which is the Torah. Father, I pray that you keep your peace upon us as we endure this walk in these troublous times. I ask this blessing in my Father's name. I say, Hallelujah, Yahuwah, Hallelujah, Yahuwah, Hallelujah, Yahuwah. Israel, peace and blessings to you. The title of today's show is called Exposing the Lies from Hell. And what I'm going to prove through the Tanakh, through the scriptures, is that Yahusha is the branch that is talked about in the Bible. Again, exposing the lies from hell, I'm going to prove through the scriptures, through the Ruach HaKodesh, is that Yahusha is the branch that is talked about in the scripture. Now, there's a lot of lies that's been, um, that's been ministered to the sheepfold. And one of the lies is that the Messiah never existed. And what I'm going to show that the Messiah existed from the very beginning. Another lie that's being um, preached amongst our people is that Joseph and Mary had intercourse. And because of their human um, interactions with the sexual relation, this is how the Messiah came into existence which is a lie from hell. What I'm going to be doing now, okay, is taking this series step by step, exposing some of these lies from a Hebraic perspective. And that's going to be the key, is that we have to begin to look at the scriptures from a Hebraic perspective, not from a Hebrew-English perspective, but from a Hebrew, from a Hebraic perspective to a Hebraic perspective. That's the only way that this thing is going to work. We can't even look at the scriptures from a Hebraic perspective to a Christian um, perspective because we're going to lose focus and everything's going to get all scrambled up and we're going to be all over the place. So what we're going to do, okay, is look at the scriptures from a Hebraic perspective. All right? And we're going to begin to expose some of these lies that's being taught amongst our people. It is our job as mores of HaMashiach, the Messiah, to expose all false teachings. All right, all false teachings. Now, the reason why I decided to do this show is because I had an interesting conversation uh, with a guy by the name of um, Elder Young One. And I even reached out to a guy by the name of Yeremi Yah. These two guys are um, real big into preaching this gospel or this, this, this doctrine that the Messiah never existed. All right? Now, I don't do personal attacks. Okay? Let me just clear that out of the way now. I don't do uh, personal attacks. It's not just these two brothers that is doing this, but there's a lot of other brothers and sisters that's doing this. But it just so happened that I reached out to um, Elder Young One, and uh, we didn't get anywhere with it. All right, so um, I reached out to Yeremi Yah, but he never responded back to me. So, but again, what I want to do is expose some of these lies that's been preached amongst our people, so that we will have a better understanding of what's going on. And to those of you who believe in Hamashiach the Messiah, stay on that path, all right, because um, that is the right path. We have um, the Father, we have the Son, and then we have the, um, the Bride, which is the nation of Yasharal. Now, again, I'm talking about Hebraic perspectives, all right? There are four main levels of looking at the Scripture. And these levels are called the Pesach, the Peshat level. Alright, the Peshat level just means the literal meaning of the scripture. Alright? And there's nothing wrong with the literal meaning of the scripture. Another way of looking at the scripture is called the Remez level. 
the Ramez level, all right? And this is what we call um, the hint. Then the third level is called Drosh. That level where we begin to seek what's going on in the scripture. And then the fourth level would be called the Sud or the Sod. Okay, Sud, the Sod, which means um, the secrets. It means secret or mystery. All right, so these four levels of reading the scripture is going to be very, very important because this teaches us to look at the scriptures from a Hebraic perspective. We cannot look at the scriptures from a, uh, an English perspective because we have to remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all of our forefathers were Hebrews. They were Hebrews, so the, um, the overstanding has to be from a Hebraic perspective. Any other way, we're going to, um, we're going to miss the boat. If you try to look at the scriptures from a Christian perspective, okay, we're going to miss the boat. The only way that we can get a, a, a better understanding of the scriptures is if we read it from a Hebraic perspective. I'm going to give a quick example. I should have left that up, but I'm going to give you a quick example. Um, in the Aramaic, let's look at the word, because if, if you notice what in my prayer I said at the end, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Let's look at that word hallelujah. We have, this is Aramaic. We have the ha, the lamed, and the lamed. All right? This writing here is Aramaic. All right? These characters are not Hebrew. This is Aramaic. When we look at now the pictographs, the pictographs now is actually Hebrew, like I have here on my garment here. This is, this is Hebrew. This is Aramaic. When we look at this word, what the strong concordance is doing a lot is that they're giving an English all right, definition to this word, which means praise. Which means praise, all right? But when we look at this now from a Hebraic perspective, where we now translate Hebrew to Hebrew, it's a little different. In ancient Hebrew, with the pictographs, this ha would actually look like this. Behold. All right? These two symbols here, all right? The shepherd's hope. A staff. This is picture graph. This is actually Hebrew or Abra. This is Aramaic. Now, let's look at this definition from a Hebraic concrete perspective versus the Aramaic in an abstract definition. This would mean, behold the shepherd that shepherds. I'm going to write it down. This symbol here would mean, behold the shepherd that shepherds. I think it's one P, but we get the point. Behold the shepherd that shepherds. This is what this means. And so now, the next question would be now, if we are to behold the shepherd that shepherds, what is it that the shepherd is shepherding? He's shepherding the sheepfold. All right? So we're beholding the shepherd that shepherds the sheepfold. So when I say um, hallelujah, I'm giving praises to the Father for behold the shepherd that shepherds the sheepfold, and the sheepfold is Israel. 
is Israel, all right? And all those that want to follow Torah. So, again, when we look at Hebrew, the pictographs, and look at the Aramaic, and then looking at what came after the pictographs, where we get now, let me just erase this, and we're going to then begin looking at the scriptures from a Hebraic perspective. Because after we came from the pictographs, we got another form of writing where we have the pictographs, we have this form of writing, and the way that it was taught, you know, we have the, the Aleph, the Bet, the Gamet, the, um, the Daleth, um, the, the Ha, and, you, you know, so it just goes on here. These are um, the next form of writing after the pictographs, but again, this is the Aramaic, and this is Halal, which means praise, but this again is Aramaic, this is Hebrew um, writing, and then we have um, the pictographs. So again, I just wanted to bring that out to show that in order to get a, a better understanding of what's going on in the scriptures, we will have to be able to look at the scriptures from a Hebraic perspective, all right, and not looking at it from a English perspective, because the definitions are going to change, and maybe that's the reason why some brothers or sisters aren't able to see Hamashiach, the Messiah, from the very beginning. Let's go to some scriptures here. Let's go to the book of um, Proverbs, all right? Uh, the book of Tehillim, excuse me, the book of Mishli, the book of Mishli, the 25th chapter. And I'm going to go a little bit more further into um, to Peshat, the Remez, the Drosh, and the Sot level. It says in 25, verse 2, it says, It is the glory of Yahuwah to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. That word matter there is devar, okay, which means a saying or utterance. So I'm going to read it again. It is the glory of Yahuwah to conceal a thing, because if it's concealed, that means that we're going to have to do some research and digging and making sure that what we're saying is actually correct. Now, let's go to another scripture that ties in along with that about concealing a thing, all right, and, and it's the honor of kings to search out the matter. Because once the, uh, the situation is searched out properly, and then when we go out to teach, everything is correct. So that way, when somebody comes to, um, to challenge us on our definition of what we're saying, we will be able to go through the different levels of understanding the scripture, making sure that everything falls properly in its proper perspective, all right? Again, looking at the scriptures from a Hebraic perspective is going to be the key. Next scripture, the book of Matthew, the 13th chapter, the 44th verse. Look at the parable, okay, the side level. Look at the mystery level. Again, the kingdom of Shamayim is likened to treasure hid in a field. Okay, this is a treasure that's hidden in the field. That which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that fill. And so that's what we're doing. We're doing the proper research to make sure that the information that we're giving out is correct. We have to make sure of that. And I believe the reason why there's so much confusion in, in Israel is because a lot of us are still looking at the scriptures from a Christian perspective, or we're not quite overstanding exactly how to read the scriptures from a Hebraic perspective, all right? Now, again, the reason why I decided to do this show here is because of a lot of the false teachings that's going on out here, and um, I only have a couple of pages here. It's not going to take long to try to bring some clarity to the situation. 
What needs to be understood now is that Israel always, they always had a need of an interceder or intercessor. Now, every interceder alluded to the physical manifestation of Hamashiach the Messiah. I'm going to read it again. Every interceder alluded to the physical manifestation of Hamashiach Yahusha. This is the reason why we find ourselves, even in the book of Genesis, all right, where we see now um, Adam trying to atone for his own sins. Adam could not atone for his own sins. It was Yahuwah, okay, who provided a temporary covering for Adam and his wife. So we see now where it's very important, all right, for an interceder to be involved in our lives to bring us back into covenant relationship with the Father. Point one, as I said earlier, Adam was supposed to be an interceder for Yahuwah, the center part one, to restore order back on the earth. But he, Adam, okay, relinquished this position by following his Isha, or his Asha, and entertained disagreeable spirits. Point two, the nation of Israel was also given this position as kings and princes of the earth to bring the other nations into the Torah wall. So just, be, they see, there's a responsibility with us being um, Israelites. Our job was to be an interceder or a mediator for the Father in bringing the other nations into this covenant wall. So it shouldn't be hard for us to um, understand that even Israel needs an interceder because of the sin that happened in the Garden of Eden. Because what's happening is this. If a brother or sister is saying that the Messiah never existed, and if the book of Revelations is a lie, and the book of Daniels is a lie, actually what you're saying now is that the whole Bible is garbage, is what you're saying. Because how can you look at the book of Daniel, all right, and, and with the proper understanding of Daniels and um, the 70-week the 70 ministry of the Messiah, how can you say that the book of Daniel is a lie? Because by you saying that, that means that everything in the Tanakh, okay, is a lie. Because one book is complementing the next book. For example, the book of Deuteronomy, okay, or the book of Deborah, okay, is being complemented by the book of Numbers. Numbers is being complemented by the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus is being complemented by the book of Exodus. And then um, Genesis. These are all one book, all right? complementing one another. So when we begin to look at now um, shadow pictures, again, if you're saying that the book of Revelation is garbage, and if you say throw away the book of Daniel, you might as well go ahead and throw away the whole book. And then where will you be? Israel. This is my testimony, this is my gospel, from what I'm getting from out of the scripture. Is that Israel always needed an intercessor, or an interceder, or a mediator, always. And it's our responsibility as being that light in the world, okay, to be this mediator or to be this example for the other nations so that they can also follow in this Torah walk. Let's go to the scriptures here. Let's go to the book of um, Deborah 14 and 2. These are some of the basic scriptures that we, um, that we might already know. Let's look at the responsibility of Israel. Because just because you, you're an Israelite means really nothing if you're not following the law, statutes, and commandments, and if you're not being that light to the world. This is what Yahuwah says. For thou art a set-apart people unto Yahuwah thy mighty one. And Yahuwah hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself, above all the nations that are upon the earth. So the question should be this now. Hamashiach, okay, is the mediator. The father chose the nation of Israel. Hamashiach is the groom, the nation of Israel is the bride. Being that we were chosen to be the set apart people, what is now your responsibility to the other nations? Because Israel was chosen from amongst all the other nations here. So now what is your responsibility? 
You're supposed to be that mediator. So how can you say now, all right, that the book of Daniel's is no good, the book of Revelation is no good, and Israel can atone for her own sins, which is it, it's a bold-faced lie. If Israel was able to atone for her own sins, why was it when Israel committed to sin and she tried to cover herself, why wasn't that sufficient enough for Israel? I'm talking about Adam and Eve. Why wasn't that sufficient enough? A covering was made by the father, Yahuwah, and then Israel, okay, was um, kicked out of the Garden of Gan or the, or the Garden of Eden. That temporary covering that was given to Adam and Eve, all right, was a prophetic shadow picture of the coming of HaMashiach, the Messiah. Let's go on. Let's go to the book of Deborah, the 26th chapter. Israel, we have a responsibility to be mediators to the other nations. 26, 18, I'm going to start at verse 17, read down to 19. Thou hast avouched Yahuwah to be thy mighty one. This is a marriage here. And to walk in his ways and to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and to hearken to his voice. And Yahuwah have avouched this day to be his peculiar people as he has promised thee and that thou shouldest keep all his commandments and to make thee high above all nations which he had made in praise and in name and in honor and that thou mayest be an holy or set apart people unto Yahuwah thy mighty one as he has spoken. So again, with this commission that's been given to the nation of Israel, what is your responsibility? What is your responsibility towards the other nations? You're supposed to be that mediator. You're supposed to be that interceder, okay, for the other nations because they also should want to walk in the Torah. Our job now is to bring the scattered sheep back into the sheepfold. We are the voice pieces for the Father and the Son. That's our commission. That was the commission of the disciples, the Talmud. This was, this was their responsibility, was to bring the sheepfold back home. That was the Messiah's responsibility, okay, to bring forth now the sheepfold that was scattered back into the proper, uh, her proper rest. Let's go on with some more scriptures here. The book of Exodus, 19. Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you, sh and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, and a set-apart nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Now, this means that the nation of Israel has a responsibility. Okay? A responsibility. When following the law, statutes, and commandments, all right, you're now supposed to show forth this glory to the rest of the world. You're that bridge. The earth is mourning, waiting for the true sons and daughters of Yahuwah to manifest themselves. We're that mediator. This is the reason why Yahuwah chose the nation of Israel. All right, let's go to some more. Let's go to the book of Ecclesiasticus, the 17th chapter. The 17th chapter. And we read the 17th verse. For the division of the nations of the whole earth, he set a ruler over every people. But Yasharal is Yahuwah's portion. Being that, again, if we are the Father's portion, what is your responsibility to the other nations? All right? That is very, very important. Let's do something here, all right? There are a few Hebrew words here um, that we're going to be using today to help us understand that Yahushua existed from the very beginning. 
One of these words that we're going to be looking at is the word um, scepter. Scepter. P-T-R-E. And scepter is the Strong's number 76, 26. And that word means in Hebrew, um, Shabbat. Shabbat. Okay? The next word that we want to look at to give us a better understanding so that there would be no problems uh, whether a brother is not sure or sister is not sure whether or not Hamashiach the Messiah existed from the very beginning. Another word we could be looking at is the word rod. R-O-D. Rod. Okay? And that strong concordance number is 42 94 and the Hebrew word for rod is uh, mata. Mata. All right. The next word that we're going to be using uh, today is called is the word staff. Staff. And the staff is the Strong's number also, 4294, and that word also means mata. You might see it spelled with an E, all right? And again, I, I'll get into that a, a, a lot, a little bit later on, all right? But mata is the word that I'm going to be using today for the definition of the word staff. The next one is the word branch. This word right here is going to be very, very important, the word branch. And the word branch is the strong um, number 5341 and 5342, all right? And the branch, this word is associated with the word netzer, netzer. All right, or Samak. All right, and the next word we want to dab in a little bit is the word, um, which means to Germany. All right, which means to Germany. The word is um, Mak Makola. Makwala, all right? Actually, it should make me spell this way, M-A-Q-A-L-A-H, all right? But to help with the pronunciation, Makwala, a Makwala, all right? Now, these words are going to be very, very uh, important because these five words here are descriptive code words when we look at the scriptures from a Hebraic perspective, and remember now, those four levels all right, that, that I talked about, um, the Peshat, the Remez, the Drash, and the Sad level, the Sad level, or the Hint level, is going to give us a better all right, understanding that all five of these words here is pertaining to Hamashiach, the Messiah, that we can find in the Tanakh. Now, the first scripture that we want to go to is the book of Bereshit 49 and 10. 49 and 10. Forty nine and ten. Let's look at some uh, prophetic shadow pictures here. It says the scepter should not depart from Yehuda. Okay? So we're looking at this word right here, scepter, which is the strong number 7621, and that word means Shabbat. The scepter should not depart from Yehuda, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and until him shall be the gathering of the people. Now, what I find very interesting here with uh, the book of Bereshit, or the book of Genesis 49 and 10, is that it's already telling us, all right, from the very beginning, that there will be a split between northern and southern kingdom. 
because it talks about through Hamashiach the Messiah shall be the gathering of the people. It's already been prophesied, okay, from the very beginning that there will be a split and northern kingdom and southern kingdom never got along. Never ever got along. So this is a prophetic shadow picture letting us know again that there will be a split and that this king, all right, is going to regather the 12 tribes of Israel that is scattered abroad. Let's look at that word scepter, all right? Let's look at that word scepter, which is the Strong's number, um, 7626. 7626. Seventy-six twenty-six. It says here the word Shabbat uh, means to branch off a stick for punishing, writing, fighting, or ruling. So we should already know now that this ruling rod or staff here is pertaining to Hamashiach the Messiah. I'm going to read it again. A stick for punishing, writing, fighting, ruling, walking, etc. Shabbat means a tribe, all right, a tribe. So when we go back now and keep everything in the Hebraic perspective, we're talking about a tribe, and we're looking at this word scepter here now, and this word scepter means, it also has a definition of, um, of, of tribe. The, the tribe or the scepter or this rulership should not depart from Yehuda nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. So we know now that this scepter, this ruling authority, is pertaining to the Messiah. I'm going to read on. The rod as a tool is used by the shepherd. All right? And who is the shepherd? The shepherd is, all right, Hamashiach, the Messiah. It is the Messiah that shepherds, all right, the sheepfold. I am the good shepherd. This is what Hamashiach, the Messiah, said. So again, being able to put these, this puzzle together is going to be very important because we already have right now the beginning shadow pictures of the Messiah existing from the very beginning. I'm going to read on. Shabbat means a tribe or a rod. The rod as a tool is used by the shepherd. And then it has Leviticus 27, 32, 32nd verse. It says, and the teacher. And everybody should know who the teacher is. It is the symbol of authority in the hands of a ruler. And who is this ruler? That is talked about in the book of Genesis 49 and 10 again. It's talking about the Messiah. Whether um, it is the, the scepter. Definition number three. The symbolic element comes to expression and description of the messianic rule. The messianic rule is pertaining to the Messiah. That's the reason why I've done so many shows before when we talk about the early reign and the latter reign. The early reign is that it proves to us now is that the Messiah did not come to rule. He did not come. But when we go to the book of Yeshayahu now, the 61st, uh, the book, 61st chapter, it tells us now about the two stages of when the Messiah is going to come. He's going to come back the second time under this authority, okay, ruling the nations with a rod of iron, okay, of the rod of iron. The fourth definition, the word Shabbat is most frequently used to denote a tribe, and that tribe that Hamashiach is coming out of is the tribe of Yehuda. all right? This is all prophecy, prophetic shadow pictures. To denote a tribe, a division in a nation, it is the preferred term for the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay? The 12 tribes of Israel. What we're going to do is that we're going to try to break this thing down, okay, step by step. Next thing that I want to do is I want to go to the book of Bamidbar. Okay, the book of Numbers. 2417 because if the book of Revelation is a lie the way that some brothers and sisters are teaching and if the book of Daniels is a lie that would also then mean that the book of Genesis is a lie 
and the book of Numbers is a lie, and that the whole Tanakh is a lie. Now, again, 24, 17. This is Balak. Balak wants to curse Israel, okay, but Balaam sees the Messiah in the vision. Verse 14. And now behold, I go unto my people, come therefore, and I will advertise thee what this people, which is Israel, shall do to thy people in the latter days. Okay? The latter days is talking about, okay, um, end times. Okay? We're talking about doing the messianic rule. That's going to be very important. It's also talking about, okay, um, the last parts of the feast, which happens in the seventh month. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam, the son of Beor, has said, and the man whose eyes are open has said, he hath said which heard the words of Yahuwah, and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. I shall see him, but not now. So the question then becomes, who is the him, okay, that Balaam is seeing? Again, verse 17, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not near. There shall come a star out of Jacob. That star is very important. Because that word halal, that uh, halal, that halal, halalu, excuse me, that I had brought out earlier, also um, means um, a star. Okay, preferably maybe the North Star. So it's very interesting because we also see astrology that's also involved in helping us to understand that this is a future prophecy pertaining to the Messiah. Let's look what Balaam saw. I see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not near. There shall come a star out of Jacob. That star is Hamashiach the Messiah. And a scepter, we talked about in the book of Genesis 49 and 10. And a scepter shall rise, or a nation, somebody out of the nation of Judah now, shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and shall destroy the, um, the children of Seth. Or Sheth, all right. Again, these scriptures, I'm breaking down the word scepter and the word rod. What I'm alluding to is that all of these words pertain to Hamashiach, the Messiah. We talked about scepter, okay, which is the Strongest of the 7626, and the word is Shebet. We talked briefly about the word rod, but that's the Strong's number 4294, which means mata. Let's now go into that definition and prove further. And prove further now that Hamashiach was prophesied to come in the flesh from the very beginning. Hamashiach the Messiah is that mediator. Israel. We will never be able to atone for our own sins. Because what we're talking about here is sinless blood. Sinless blood. That's the only blood that will be acceptable, okay, in covering or kapar, a kapor, okay, the sins of the nation of Israel. Let's look at the next word, 4294. And the word is batah. 4294. 4294. Let's see how this pertains to the Messiah. The word Mata. We're going to go also to 5186, all right? 5186. The word Mata means a branch. A branch. The word branch is a descriptive code word. The word branch here. That's pertaining to the Messiah. Yahusha is that branch. But all but these two words here so far, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna go line upon line. These two words here are descriptive code words, letting us know that this is pertaining to the Messiah, and the Messiah is the branch. We're gonna go to the scriptures to prove that. A branch, a tribe, also a rod, 
whether for chastising, okay, ruling, a scepter, throwing or walking, a staff, a support of life or a supporter of life. And that's the, that was the job of Hamashiach the Messiah. He is our supporter of life. And what gives us life is the Ruach HaKodesh and following the Torah. Um, definition number two. The word is used to refer to a number of kinds of rods. Rod which symbolizes spiritual power. Verse, I mean, definition number three. This noun is often used elliptically instead of the rod of the tribe of the word signifies tribe. So with that definition of alone, alone now, we should see how everything is lining up with the definition of these words. Now, and these are English definitions to these Hebrew words, but they're still lining up properly, aligning us to the, the, the direct path that this is all pertaining to Hamashiach the Messiah. We talked a little bit about the branch. All right? Now, let's go to the definition 5186. 5186, excuse me here. 5186. Fifty-one eighty-six is the Hebrew word nata. Nata connotes extending something outward, for towards something or someone. Again, nata means to stretch forth, to spread out, to stretch down, to turn aside. Nata connotes extending something outward and towards something or someone. Um, definition 1a. This is a figure, a figure of Yahuwah's active, sovereign, and mighty involvement in the affairs of men. 1b. So this phrase means to stretch out something until it reaches a goal. Now, let's look how this ties in with, um, let's go to the book of Exodus. The book of Shemot, the book of Exodus, the fourth chapter. And then I have to read that definition again. I should have read this definition first. The book of Shemot, the fourth chapter. I'm just going to read the second verse. Verses three and four are very important, but what I'm going to do is that I'm going to fall back on that for today, all right? And I'll come back to that a little bit later on because I don't want to get involved in another topic. But verse 3 and 4 is beautiful. We're just going to deal with verse 2 for now. And Yahuwah said unto him, What is in thy hand? And he said, A rod. We broke down the word rod, and the word rod is mata, and I already gave the definition, all right? Now, so we have now um, the word um, we, so what we have now is that Moses is extending his rod, okay? This rod is a prophetic shadow picture of Hamashiach um, Yahusha. That's what that rod. That's what that rod means. And so what's happening now is that when Moses stretches forth, okay, his rod is creating a shadow. The shadow isn't the very thing. The thing that we should be concentrating now on what's casting the shadow. And what's casting the shadow is the rod. I already went to the definition of what the word uh, what the word rod means. And the Hebrew word is uh, matah in the definition that is given in 4294. And it's relating to Hamashiach, the Messiah. Again. Moses is using a rod. The rod is a prophetic shadow picture of the Messiah. When you extend anything out, it produces a shadow when you see it on the ground. Things were given to Israel in increments, in different stages. Again, the staff is 
what we're supposed to be looking at, not the actual shadow. The rod represents Hamashiach, the Messiah. And I will do the third um, um, verse or the fourth verse a little bit later on. So you should see where I'm going with all of this. Because in the next um, lesson that I do, I'm going to deal with um, the virgin birth. Alright? Now, the next um, word that I want... No, let's go back to that definition again. I just want to make sure everything is, um, is clear here in um, 4294. I just want to make sure that, that I drive this whole thing home in 4294. Excuse me, 5186. 5186. 5186. And the word is nata, and it means um, to, to spread out, to stretch down, to turn aside. Um, so Yahuwah told Moses, I will redeem you with a stretched out arm. With the great judgment, and then we have Exodus six and six uh, one eight. This is a figure of the um, of the Father's act of sovereign and mighty involvement in the affairs of men. So this phrase means to stretch out of something until it reaches a goal. So again, with Moses stretching out his arm, okay, with with the staff in his hand. Now is that it's it's stretching out towards a goal. And what is the goal? The goal is Hamashiach the Messiah. That's the goal. But again, these are our prophetic shadow pictures because again, when something is extended out, it produces a shadow. And the shadow is not the very thing, but it's the staff, it's the rod, it's the scepter, okay, it's the branch. All of these words here again pertain to the Messiah. We can't miss Israel. We can't miss. Alright? So the next word that I want to look into is the word um, Let's go to the word branch. 5341. 5341. 5341. The word Branch, like I said earlier, is the word Netzer or Samak. Netzer. A prime root that means to guard, which is also the word Shemar. Guard in a good sense. To protect or maintain. Netzer means to watch, to guard, to keep. And then it goes on to say that Netzer is found for the first time in the biblical text. In Exodus 34 and 7. Uh, definition number two. Netzer is frequently used to express the idea of guarding something such as a vineyard. And we know who protects the vineyard, okay, is the good shepherd, which is Hamashiach, the Messiah. Um, 5342. Netzer. In the sense of greenness as striking color, a shoot, a descendant, a branch. So what I've done so far is describe in descriptive detail that each one of these things here, and we're going to get to um, Makwala, all of this is pertaining to Hamashiach the Messiah. Now, the word branch is mentioned five times, okay, five times in um, the, uh, the so-called Old Testament. Five times. And that's very important. Let's go to that and see and prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Messiah is spoken about at least five times with this word branch. And it's also written in, uh, in capital letters, okay? Now, what we have to understand here is that there are no capital letters in Hebrew. For one, there are no capital letters, there are no commas, there are no periods, none of those things there. But what we have to do now is realize is that when something is repeated more than one time, we should pay close attention 
to what's going to what's going on in the verse. We have to pay very close attention. Let's look at the five times where the branch is uh, mentioned. We're going to go to the book of Yeshayahu. Yeshayahu, um, verse 11, verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod, and we broke down the word rod. There shall come forth a rod. Put this here. There shall come forth a rod, and the rod was um, 4294, which is the Hebrew word matar. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch, or a samach, or a netzer, shall grow out of his roots. This is all pertaining to the Messiah. All of this. Prophetic shadow pictures. We can't miss. Let's go to the Strong's number 5342. 5342. We want to prove all things. This branch is referring to the Messiah. 51, excuse me, 5342. 53, 53, 42. We did the definition already, actually which means um, branch. And this branch is referring to the Messiah. The next definition that we want to look at is, um, let's look at the book of Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah. So, Because we already have one definition of the word branch, and that word branch is referring to the Messiah. Let's look at Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23 and verse 5. 23 verse 5 Behold the days come which is a future prophecy Behold the days come saith Yahuwah that I will raise unto David a righteous branch This branch is referring to the Messiah A righteous branch and a king shall reign and prosper and he shall execute judgment and justice in the earth Every one of those definitions that I brought out earlier is describing, okay, the redemptive role of Hamashiach, the Messiah. One more time. Behold, the days come, saith Yahuwah, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, which is the word Samach, okay, and a king shall reign and prosper, and he shall execute judgment and judgment and justice in the earth. Now, that strong concordance number is um, 6780. Looking at the word branch here, 6780. 67, let's do 69, 6779 and 6780. The word is samak, to sprout or to grow or to spring forth, to spring up, to grow up, to bring forth, to bud, to spring out, to bear, to bud forth. 6780, Samak. From 6779, the word Samak means literally a branch, a bud, a branch, that which grows to spring, springing, grew. So everything is still lining up in perfect order that these descriptive cold words are all alluding to Hamashiach the Messiah. So when we look at now, Koniah, okay, Koniah, and let's, let's read it, I'm not going to go too much into it, it's uh, book of Jeremiah 22-28, it says, is this man Koniah a despised broken vessel, is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure, wherefore are they cast out, he and his seed, and are cast into a land which they know not, O earth, O earth, Earth, hear the words of Yahuwah. Thus saith Yahuwah, write this man childless, childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days. For no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. But we have now here a samak, a branch that's going to come forth, all right, 
out of this cutout line here. And I just leave it there for now because all of this is going to be alluding to now whether Joseph and Mary had sexual intercourse or not. And I'll leave that there for now. All right? Leave that right there. So those of us that's familiar with this scripture already, all right, you should know where this is leading to. There's no way in the world, okay, that anybody can say that the Messiah never existed and that Joseph and Mary had sex and this is how the Messiah came into existence. That is um, a fraudulent, um, erroneous teaching and we will deal with that, all right? The next branch that we want to talk about is in the book of Jeremiah, the 33rd chapter, verse 15. Jeremiah 33, 33, 15. We're talking about the five times where we see the branch being spoken of. 33, 15. In those days, and at that time, will I cause the branch, the branch again is talking about Hamashiach, the Messiah. The branch of righteousness shall grow up into David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. And so again, we should already know where I'm going with, because this also ties in. This branch that's coming out is also relating to what happened um, with Joseph and Mary. All right, so again, I, I, I'm going to leave it alone. I, I'm not, not going to go there. But again, in those days and at that time, will I cause a branch of righteousness to grow up into David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. So this is now the third scripture that I'm using that describes to us in a prophetic shadow picture that the branch is referring to Hamashiach the Messiah, who people say never existed. All right? The next, and it's the same Strong's number, 6780. The next one is uh, the book of um, Zechariah, or the book of um, Zechariah, who? Um, 3 and 8. Zechariah 3 and 8. Hear now, O Yahushua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wandered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. It's in capital letters, but again, there are no capital letters in Hebrew. But special emphasis is being put here, letting us know that this branch is referring to Hamashiach, the Messiah. And again, that's the Strong's number, 6780. All right, 6780. The fifth scripture talking about the branch. Zechariah, the sixth chapter verse um, verse 12 and speaketh to him saying thus speaketh Yahuwah of hosts saying behold the man whose name is the branch which is talking about Hamashiach the Messiah he shall grow up out of his place and he shall build or rebuild the temple so we're talking about the regathering of the nation of Yasharal that also ties in with the book of Genesis, okay, on the book of Bereshit, 49 verse 10. Israel, there's going to be a lot of shows that I'm going to be doing proving that the Messiah existed from the very beginning. All right, um, like I always say, and I tell brothers to hold fast to that which thou hast, that no man takes your crown, that it can be proven that the Messiah existed from the very beginning. I pray, brothers and sisters, that you've gotten something out of this um, teaching today. And if there's any questions regarding anything that I said, please leave a comment. And um, again, we must destroy all right, these lies that's being taught that the Messiah never existed. With that, Israel, I say Shabbat, no, not Shabbat Shalom, but Shalom, and I'll see you the next time in the next lesson. Peace.